Welcome to another episode of Cranked and Ranked. We're back here for what is the last episode of Cranked and Ranked for the year 2020. And um, for those of you who are new, welcome to this show. It's a show where we rank things that are rock or metal or music related, uh, usually uh, <laughs> band discography, sometimes other shit. Uh, today's going to be a band discography. I, I'm, as usual, I am old head or Steven, depending on what you want to call me. Or some people just call me old, which that's fine. I am. <laughs> um, and then w- <laughs> with me as always is, is uh, Eddie Sparks, AKA young. <laughs> <laughs> Howdly doodly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so this is, it's been interesting. So this is, this is the last episode we're going to put out in 2020. Um, next time we're, we're out there, it will be a brand new year. And God forsaken fucking year this has been. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, though, because I was thinking about that, because um, from my point of view, I realized that in the grand scheme of things, this has been a shit show of a year for a lot of people. But to be completely honest, this year's been pretty good for me. I'm already kind of a shut in anyway. So once I had a reason to do it, I was just like, oh, shit, I can do this. Like, cool. All right. I don't like people. I don't want to touch people. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to go anywhere. So I'm good. <laughs> um, but it's been it's actually been pretty good. And one of the things that's made it great is doing this podcast with you. Yeah, it's it's um, it's been awesome. And. For those of you, because I've we've never really discussed the origin of of this, which was essentially, um, I think that you sent me an email. Yeah, I, I don't think I I don't think I knew your channel at first, but then you either commented or something, and then I went over and found your channel, and then became a fan pretty instantly. Yeah, because I I remember you and I would get, uh, you know, I would comment on your videos and and we had a good back and forth with that. And yeah. then eventually, you know, you came over to my channel and thought, Hey, this guy's, this guy's not half bad. So, uh, yeah, I emailed you. And, uh, I think the first thing we did was shout each other out on, yeah. on each other's videos. Cause we, I think it was like did. the, I think you shouted me out on the second, uh, Megadeth, ranking video or something this was before cranked and ranked this is uh when i was doing my own content. rankings by myself the lonely <laughs> ranking shows <laughs> but but um, um yeah so we both shouted each other out yeah and then uh i i remember where i was actually when i emailed you i was at uh i was at the library at my university at the time and i emailed you in the middle of doing some like work on a video and we got talking and by the time I'd finished all of like my uni stuff, uh, we pretty much got this off the ground as soon as possible, really. Well, well it was, and, I mean, uh, the thing that you're missing is the fact that, because I remember where I was where you emailed me too. I was literally sitting in a, in a waiting room at a, at a car uh, registration place. I was waiting to get my car inspected and get registration tags and um and then you emailed me and so the, this was all your idea like your email to me yeah. just just <laughs> said let's do we should do a show where we rank stuff and we should call it cranked and ranked like literally this whole this just all just came from you and i was just like yeah. hell yeah <laughs> and i remember that was around the time it may have been march cuz i remember it was just around the time that people were like oh you may want to start staying inside cuz there's this virus thing yeah uh, it was yeah. right around there and then it took us a few, a few months because you were finishing school and whatnot yeah. to finally get it together. But I think we discovered that June was the beginning of Cranked and Ranked. And uh, we've just been off and running. And it's been awesome. And it's and it, as far as I'm concerned, it's ongoing forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> so, Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm um, done with that. So yeah, so that's the origin of Cranked and Ranked. It's all, it's all from Eddie's um, marvelous brain. And um, I'm just somebody that uh, I, I think I play the, the good, like if we were in Lethal Weapon, you're Mel Gibson and I'm Danny Glover. 
Like, cause <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're more of the wild card and I don't really know what you're going to be up to, but I'm just over here being like two days to retirement, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too old for this shit. I pray I don't have to defuse a bomb while you're on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some would say I'm usually defusing bombs on the toilet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so that's why it works out. And so, uh, anyway, that's a uh, that's that's just a little for those of you who are, who who, are, who have been listening for a while. There you go, um, a little a little nugget of uh, of the origin story. Um, quite like Wolverine origins. It's uh, <laughs> it's the <laughs> origin. Only only I think we'd make a better movie. <laughs> oh hell yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, so yes, Crankton ranked, and so we're here to rank the last band of uh, 2000, and we're gonna take it into the 90s. Uh, but every time we've been doing the 90s, for the most part, it seems like we we were on the grunge side of things. Although Ugly Kid Joe wasn't, but um, so we decided to go back to the 90s, but not not hit the grunge area. We're gonna go to a different area of the heavy music. Yeah. And so the band we're going to be ranking today is the band Helmet, um, which is, uh, you know, New York. I, I don't know what you would even call them alternative metal, but they you could there's so many different um, genre sub genre things that you could assign to Helmet. And I guess alternative metal is the best blanket term. Yeah, because like really they don't sound like other alternative metal bands. Alternative no. metal bands sometimes sound like Helmet, because Helmet were kind of trailblazers, really, for that kind of sound. Yeah. And you could also lump them into to post-hardcore, but, but it's the same thing, where they don't sound like a lot of post-hardcore bands. Yeah. So... I, w- I would even go as far as to put them in the groove metal arena, too. I, I feel I, yeah. I feel like if there was a family tree, all of those things would connect somehow to helmet. Yeah. Um, and heads up, this is an episode from 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 my point of view is probably going to give people whiplash <laughs> because <laughs> because um, the the first thing that I would say so so as we normally do, we'll talk about where helmet came into our lives. Um, I discovered helmet in. Uh, 1992 when meantime came out and the song yeah. un- un- unsung un- sung nope it's called unsung <laughs> i don't know why i added an extra g that's really dumb but um <laughs> the video for unsung was on mtv and it was just everything you know sometimes you hear those songs that you didn't know you needed this in your life yeah and so i immediately went out and bought the album and it's been one of my favorites ever since. And so um, um, I'll get into it a little more later, but Helmet was actually insanely influential on me as a musician and a, and a songwriter because the stuff that was co- going on in 91, 92, 93, that, that, the things I discovered around there all kind of went, because I was learning how to play guitar and write songs at that time also. So... Helmet's one of those bands that is very important in my life. Um, so where did, where did you discover Helmet? Um, I discovered Helmet uh, long before I actually really got into them. So mm-hmm. I would say, uh, <laughs> much like many of the bands we've talked about, I actually uh, I heard Unsung on... GTA San Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, Which is, we should get them to sponsor us or something because <laughs> they get mentioned on almost every episode. Who, whatever yeah. company that is. What company makes those games? Uh, Rockstar Games. All right, Rockstar Games, we're looking at you. We're gonna, we'll start doing commercials for you um, if you want us to. Get Cut out GTA games. 6 already. It's been nearly eight years. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and apparently nobody's happy with this cyberpunk game, so we got to get something else out there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it it's you know it's on the kind of grunge grunge alt metal station on that mm-hmm. game uh and it's i first time i heard unsung i was like oh this this is fucking cool but it's like 
they're a very bare bones band when it comes to like the approach it's very straight ahead very rhythmic but also really staccato and technical when it doesn't necessarily sound uh proggy it's so more, there's a lot it's of more like, of a if it's more of a precision than a, a virtuosity because the yeah because the big thing about helmet that's so great and bands that ended up being kind of like them are those ba- those are bands where it's unique because the the empty spaces are just as important as the loud spaces they yeah. create the groove and helmet is known for the staccato and the just having just having a riff that has a has a note and stops it and then brings it back with the rhythm and it just makes it that much more heavier so it's so interesting to think of a band that they're very loud but the parts where there's nothing are equally as important as the parts where there's everything. Yeah, it's like unsung very easily could have gone like with palm mutes in between. Yeah. When in actual fact it just da na 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 and it's really utilizing the idea of just that stop start stop kind of thing. Yeah. In a really cool innovative way because really in terms of other bands there weren't really many at the time i mean i suppose you could make an argument for like you know melvin's or soundgarden using the drop d kind of thing but it was still relatively new territory in like i I feel like the idea of the stops and starts and staccato style riffs i think that comes a lot more from your post-punk kind of stuff like your gang of four yeah uh bands like that um, I think they they used a little more of that, but it wasn't heavy. It was it was a little more stripped down and like indie rock kind of stuff. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's I tried to do a little bit of searching in my brain of like you know where they fit in and and were they really as innovative as I think they are, and and I, I feel like they are. I, I feel like they yeah they came came across with something that nobody had done in the way that they were doing it and then people like me um, wanted to just re- try to recreate it for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is one of those things as well. Um, I like what you said there, where it's more about precision than virtuosity, because there's not really any shred. And even if there is, it's usually more of a noise kind of approach, where it's like just straight up kind of stuff. Yeah, um, the, the solos and helmet songs are not, are, I don't think he writes those solos. It's more just a feeling of where where should I put my fingers to make the wildest noises that I can during this solo. Yeah. And it, it's, it's funny as well because they kind of straddle this line between two unlikely combinations where you've got that kind of indie rock sensibility with a beefy metal sound yeah and you know that to me is is really cool and original of them because you know at the time i mean obviously you had grunge but they weren't part of the seattle scene you could argue they have a grungy sound at times but it's still very much its own thing yeah it's 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 more of a gritty east coast kind of thing it's. I feel like it is. It, it does splinter off from the New York hardcore um, yeah. thing, but um, it de- definitely more. I don't. I don't know. Classy. I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah. So so let's. But let, you know what? Let's let's just jump right into it. Now that we know where we all kind of came in uh, with Helmet, let's uh, let's start ranking these. So there. So there are eight full length albums. We're we're not going to talk about uh, Born Annoying, which is a collection of seven inch songs and other stuff. That's it's good, but um, we're already dealing with eight albums, so we thought we'd just stick to the full length albums. And so, um, Eddie, kick it off with your number eight. Right on. Uh, so my number eight, I've gone for Seeing Eye Dog. Seeing Eye Dog. All right, that's the 2010 album. Yep. Uh, it's. I put it in last place because of all of the albums, I found myself saving the least amount of songs. Um, so some songs made me think, oh, fuck, yeah, Helmet, you you do what you're doing. But then other tracks didn't 
quite they didn't quite hit the same mark that I come to Helmet for. Yeah. So um, yeah, track by track, uh, so long straddles that line of like alt pop rock song structure with the classic noisy metal stylings of Helmet. But it's it's not my favorite opener. It's not awful, but it, it's it's not really what I come to them for. Uh, the title track, however, ha- is much more up my alley. Uh, you know, much angrier and focused on those odd grooves and heavy vibes that I love this band for. Uh, Welcome to Old Years has a similar feel to So Long, in my opinion. Again, nothing awful. It's just not hitting that, not hitting that oomph that I I like from Helmet. But then mm. again, <laughs> jump over to LA Water is a really vibey one, you know, verging on Jane's addiction meets Saigon kick territory at points. You know, I <laughs> love I mean, I think that description is better than the song really, but <laughs> but, but yeah, that's that's I could see that. Yeah, it, it, in person is more of a punky one. It's it's very straight ahead, fuck your shit up kind of sound in the riffage in the middle, but it's got some more like, you know, kind of twinkly guitar parts thrown in to bookend the song. Um, Morphing. Now, we come to something I don't think you'll hear on any other Helmet album. It's just this cinematic, stringy, ambient soundtrack kind of thing going on. Um, and then you get White City. has that laid-back slow relaxed headbang feel you know the kind where you don't realize you're doing it i I love when that happens yeah um and your bird can sing you know a beatles cover you know i i I can't explain why i'm totally okay with this but i guess i am (laughs) (laughs) I, i i i like this one i like i like this cover they did um miserable is is another you know kind of alt metal line straddler and then Cheese Lost has another slightly psyched out Jane's Addiction feel at points. Um, good closer. It's 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 a middle of the road meh album for me. It's yeah. it's not awful, but it's not great. I'd say half I'd say half of the album is strong. I w- I I agree with you there um, with the meh quality of the album. Um, but to me, it isn't the most meh album that they released. Um, mm-hmm. My list is my list is interesting. Um, mm. it, it's 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 interesting because it's not interesting at all. <laughs> you'll, you'll see what you'll see what I mean as we move on. Um, so uh, my number eight is the most recent album, which is called "Dead to the World," which came out Ooh. in twenty sixteen. So. Um, I'll just go ahead and get it out right now. Something happened, and we'll get more into this as we get to the albums that I'm referring to. Something happened between the original breakup of the original lineup of Helmet and them reforming. Yeah. Where I feel like Paige Hamilton, like maybe he was in a coma and he woke up and his abilities weren't all there again. (laughs) <laughs> like he was still the same dude and he knew yeah. how to do the things he was doing, but something all of a sudden was not clicking the way that it was clicking before. And this album is just filled with that. And it, it's, it, it's weird because I almost feel like at times he's trying to be more quirky with his, not only his vocals and his lyrics, but his songwriting. It's like he wants, he's trying to fit in these little quirky, different things when, in the style of helmet, it just doesn't work. It, it yeah. mixing those two things together for some reason just feels uncomfortable. And so, the one thing that he's been doing more recently is he does these lighter version of his vocals. He doesn't do his vocals the same way that he used to. It almost sounds like somebody else singing most of the time. And yeah. it, you can tell he goes. It's almost like he he picked. He used to do a lower down version of his voice, and then he started doing this up here. And so yeah. he's like singing <laughs> in a higher part of his voice that sounds uncomfortable to me. It doesn't sound, especially when you've been a Helmet fan since the early 90s and you've listened to those first four albums a lot, 
then you hear this voice and you're like, why is he singing that way? I, I don't understand. It's, it's not a huge difference. I think some people probably wouldn't even care, but for some reason I do. And on top of that, Dead to the World has way less of a groove thing going on. And the groove thing with Helmet is very important to me. Mm. Um, so I think overall I would say that, you know, this album is good, but it's hard to get excited about it. And that's the thing is I want something to get me excited, whether it's a song or even a part of a song to get me excited. And, and there's really not a lot of memorable moments on this album. And the, the, the punch of what they had in the older stuff just isn't there anymore. Even when they try to do a more helmety moment, it feels awkward and out of place. Like they're not quite nailing it right. And um, it just doesn't connect with me, which is weird because bands that are influential to me that have albums that I love so much, even weaker albums find a way to connect with me. And the later Helmet albums don't do that to where I'm a fan, so I'm going to listen to the new album when it comes out. And sometimes I'll listen to it two or three times just because, you know what, hey, I'm going to give this thing a chance because it's Helmet and, you know, they're important in my life. But... um this album is one that I listened to a few times and then I just walked away from it and I never went back to it. Um, and I, I, I guess I do get what Paige Hamilton is going for with these more recent albums because I think he's trying to stretch out as a songwriter and yeah. not just do the helmet shit over and over again. So I can appreciate that because I do like that. But when it isn't done that well, it doesn't... <laughs> It's weird. I would almost prefer them just to make the same album over, over, over and over again than experiment with something that just doesn't really seem that fleshed out or that genuine. I don't know. Overall, Dead to the World's pretty forgettable. Um, also, the production is meh. The production on like the last two albums, including Seeing Eye Dog, they almost just sound like glorified demos. Like there's a dryness to it that just sounds like it. They they recorded it in a home studio and they did their best to make it sound good. And helmet sound needs to be big and it needs some reverb. And yeah, um, it's it's just there's a lot of I can do a lot of uh, a lot of nitpicking to these later albums. Um, but yeah, it, it's Dead to the World is just another one that's come out that is once again just made me go oh all right well moving on and so uh, that's why it's last on my uh, on my helmet list. My that one's not as low for me, but I will say I do I do definitely get the uh, divide between the first and second incarnation of Helmet. Yeah, because after you know it, it, there is like a gradual evolution with each album. Yes, and and you can hear it. It is it is very gradual. You know, there's not really any vast changes from album to album. But, um, say for maybe a, a couple of examples, but yeah, I, I do see what you mean with him kind of like stretching out, you know, singing in a higher register or just also incorporating like cover songs and things like that. He's pro it's, it's probably true. It's, it's, he's probably trying to branch out as a songwriter, if anything. Yeah. But it just, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, 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 I always try to come at things and be really fair. I don't want to be just a jerk about stuff, but these are albums that I've given many chances and really tried to pull apart. Like, well, what is, what's going on here that I don't like? And at the end of the day, I'm just like, the quality is just not there. And, yeah. um, I, and I, I, I'm glad that he's still doing music and, and I guess, oh, yeah, for sure. you know, I guess the, these Hellman albums that I don't really like that much are still better than a lot of shit that's coming out. But unfortunately he's got the early stuff with, with people like me that it just, it's such, it's so important to me that it's always going to be judged against that, unfortunately, but that's just the way it works. Um, if you, yeah. if, <laughs> you know, I'd be lying if I said that I didn't do that, but I always do that. So. Cool. So, uh. My number seven, this was this was a hard pick for for me. Like the, what's gonna go at six and what's gonna go at seven, um, 
but uh, in the end, I picked Size Matters for number seven. Okay. So this is the first record from Helmet 2.0, so to speak. Uh, mm-hmm. And it it definitely is... It, it's the first of that... Whoa. There's been a, like, seven-year gap since the last album and something's happened in between kind of thing. With With... Like, there's a lot more focus on melody in the vocals, and I suppose you could say that about, you know, Aftertaste. But, again, it there were still moments where he does that ah, kind of, like, delivery. And he still yeah, the, does the it. Yeah, vo- the vocals on, on, on uh, Size Matters are definitely still pretty aggressive at times. Yeah. Yeah, he's still it, it's still got its moments, but you can hear that kind of, like... I don't know how to word it. There were, I think in my notes in a minute, I say something along the lines of like very mid 2000s vocal harmonies or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'll just jump right in my track by track. So right. you got Smart uh, exhibits a sound not dissimilar to the things found on Aftertaste, you know, equal parts groovy, hardcore riffage and vocal melody. Um, crashing foreign cars, you know, is faster and more aggressive and alternates between meantime levels of heaviness with the hookier moments of the previous album. Uh, see you dead. So far I am really enjoying the record, you know, Mm -hmm. sure. It's not the, it's not the edgier nineties incarnation of the band with like, you know, the original lineup, but, uh, there's still a cool sound to it. Um, to be honest, I would say like seven and upwards, I'm pretty consistently into it when I put it on. I think Seeing Eye Dog was the only one that just felt too inconsistent to me. Um, Where am I at? I've got uh, Drug Lord is another example of the band going into, you know, that kind of melodic territory. Enemies is is a slow track that gradually boils over. Unwound is about as close to a ballad I've heard from this band at the time of writing this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um everybody loves you now there's there's some proper 2000s rock harmonies in the vocals <laughs> at times um surgery is is full-on post grunge speak and spell has a cool feel to it uh throwing punches has some of that groove and vibe helmet made their name doing with like an added level of melody and harmony uh that the later albums show off last breath closes out the album and we have a track that's almost early helmet in sound. And, you know, all in all, I'm pretty impressed with this one. But, you know, as I went chrono- chronologically through the albums, there's a certain level to which other albums hit that you need to judge these by. Yeah. So, um, and, when, and, yeah. and this is, it's the one thing that I have to say is that the, out of all their, 2000s outputs this one has the best production i think it sounds the best yeah um, i almost feel it, like if they had had size matters production on the three proceed or whatever out whatever the word is the, the subsequent <laughs> albums um then i would i might have liked them more because sometimes the production really drags drags it down but on size matters yeah. i think it really it makes it sound full and heavy for sure yeah i i definitely hear a, a it's quite a beefy sounding record. Um, but yeah, Size Matters, number seven. Boom. Cool. I'm going to quickly <laughs> move along. We got eight albums a piece to talk about. So um, uh, uh, my number seven is your number eight, Seeing Eye Dog from 2010. Um, so um, you, you'll start feeling it happen now. What I'm doing is I'm moving backwards, folks. Um, <laughs> so Seeing Eye Dog, the big thing for me, though, I was just talking about production style of their 2000s. Um, even though this is my number seven and not my number eight, Seeing Eye Dog is the worst produced Helmet album. This is the one with the weakest demo sounding production. I don't understand. I mean, yeah. I get that they're not on a major label anymore and they probably don't have the money to hire, um, you know, producers and engineers that can just make it sound full. Or maybe they don't even want that. Maybe they're trying to have a more independent kind of sound. And that's fine. But to me, it takes away from the music. It just sounds dry and lifeless um so seeing eye dog though does have some enjoyable moments i would say 
Um, but once again, it is an album that I don't go back and listen to. When it came out, I listened to it a handful of times. And usually when Helmet puts out another record, I'll go back and revisit the last few and just be like, let me just touch on these again. And it always ends up the same way. Me going, nah, I'm still, still not on board with this. Um, but at least seeing Eye Dog has some of the Helmet heaviness um, but it still feels like it's lacking. And, you know, even the songs that are strong by the halfway point in the songs, I'm already kind of over it. So, yeah. um, it's, I don't know. It's like almost like a too little, too late kind of thing for those. And then, um, once again, the, his vocal approach just rubs me the wrong way for some reason. He, he sounds whiny at times, especially l- lyrically. <laughs> So we'll get we're gonna get to this. I'm I'm kind of waiting to say these things when we get to the album that it starts at, but you you mentioned something must have happened in his life, and it did, and I think it is directly responsible to him not only doing the kind of cringeworthy lyrics he writes, but also <laughs> doing the more whiny approach to the vocals. And it just it's not I'm being really harsh. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> in in the end I love Helmet and Paige Hamilton's uh uh you know an iconic musician in my eyes. Um but it's just it sucks that this album isn't that good. And I am on the completely other side of the fence from you when it comes to Andrew Bird can sing. Um <laughs> to to me the song should be called And Your Bird Can Go Fuck Itself. I'm just <laughs> I I think it's awful and it has no, it it just, it take it. The album is already struggling to be good in my eyes. And then that happens. And I go like, Jesus Christ, man. (laughs) Like, I, I, I mean, it's, we, I mean, we, I get it. You're into the Beatles. We all are. (laughs) We're all (laughs) into the Beatles and it's just Beatles cover songs for me just always make me go, Oh no, come on. (laughs) I don't care who does it. I mean, you know, Aerosmith does one and I love Aerosmith and I'm still going to be like, just can we skip that? Because (laughs) I just, I'm just going to listen to the Beatles do it anyway. So seeing Eye dog overall, it's, it's in the same boat as dead to the world where, um, I wish it was better and it kind of bums me out that it's not. Uh, but it's not as bad as Dead to the World, I guess. So there you go. Cool. So uh, that's a cool little segue because my number six is Dead to the World. Bam. Cool. So uh, I'm I'm just going to jump straight into the track by track. Uh, Life or Death, you know, wastes literally zero time getting straight to the point. You know, the vocals start pretty much immediately. Uh <laughs> The song, it, it, this song to me is a much better opener than the previous record. Um, I love my guru, 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 guru. Oh God, I'm turning into you. Why is it my guru? I love my guru. <laughs> yeah, I love my guru. Uh, does that does that cool thing I like, uh, where one track leads directly into the next. It, it also has some of the you know, chunky palm mutes before going to some noisy alt metal goodness. It is cool to hear some interesting, almost new wave, you know, uh, 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 kind of vocals. Yeah. But I, I, I do agree that he really is, you know, trying out different things with his voice there. Um, bad news so far, this album has kind of offered that kind of like soaring vocal atop a pounding, metal accompaniment kind of thing yeah this is like this is the ultimate culmination of their foray into melody Mm -hmm. you hear it pop pop up more and more with each ensuing release because i i don't think there's any aggressive vocals on here are there not that i remember yeah there's 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 aggressive you know guitar parts here and there but yeah for the most part it's pretty pretty tame compared to something like meantime yeah well well, shit yeah absolutely yeah um red scare has some real groovy moments on it yeah i love that uh dead to the world spooky grungy feel green shirt you know an elvis costello cover you know yeah i I gotta hand it to him at least when they do covers they don't pick the standard uh hey, what's our favorite Black Sabbath song approach that most <laughs> metal that, bands that is do? A, that is a good point. 
Uh, that's a yeah, good, that's it, a good thing. It's, it's like I love Faith No More's version of War Pigs, but there's like 50 other versions of War Pigs. There's a, it's a um, sacred Reich version of War Pigs. I, th- I think I was trying to think as well. Like there's yeah, sorry, it's a little bit of a tangent. I looked up the other day. There's a shitload of Into the Void covers. Like yeah. great riff, but, but the best my one. God. Can we can we agree that the best cover of Into the Void is by Soundgarden? Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a hell of a cover. I think um, X Hoarder did a cover of Into the Void as well. That's a fucking oh. great song. Fuck yeah, Into the Void, great song. We'll we'll do that in our Black Sabbath one one day. That's gonna be a hell of a fucking. That's gonna be a big one. That's gonna be st- another. You still Judas have your Priest. own Black Sabbath things that you got to work on. Yeah, I'm probably gonna need like at least a year to get over that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, expect the world is is one of those ballad but not a ballad tracks. Helmet do from time to time. Uh, Die alone brings the odd groove kind of thing to the table. Drunk in the afternoon feels. That's kind of like doomy Alice in Chains territory at times, mm-hmm. like the modern Alice in Chains. Uh, Look Alive. At this point, it's hard to believe that this is the same band that did Strap It On. But it is it is cool to see an obvious evolution, but with subtle changes with every release. Yeah, and, it's, and, um, it's, and it sucks that I, I feel that my, my reaction to their later stuff goes completely against what I normally feel about bands. <laughs> because normally I love it when a band tries something different, even if it doesn't work. But yeah. I don't know what it is about the quality of these these albums where it doesn't work in a way that it's just hard for me to listen to. Like it's like everyone wants to wants to, you know, argue about, you know, Saint Anger and things like that. And I'm like, well, I don't know. That's pretty damn enjoyable. <laughs> I don't, these are just like, it's like, it's, I think, I don't remember what band we were talking about, but I was talking about listening to an album and as the album's going on, it's almost like you're just, you're so tense because you're wanting it to work out and be good. And then it, the tension never goes away because you're just like, God, no, no, you almost had it there. Ah. <laughs> and then that's what these albums <laughs> feel like to me. Yeah. Um, and then finally we got life or death slow. Uh, which <laughs> bookends the album with a slow version of the opener. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, Dead to the World, no, number six. Number Bam. six, Dead to the World. Cool. And so um, I am just going to continue walking backwards in the Helmet discography, and my number six <laughs> is the album Monochrome from 2006. Um, this one at least has, it sounds heavy, and it's got a lot of groove. And aggression in it. Um, the production's not amazing, but um, it doesn't bother me that much. It's a little raw, but at least it's not as dry, I guess, as the mm. the next two albums. Um, now there there are things that Helmet does on these later albums that I find fascinating. Um, where they will, I say they, Paige Hamilton will write a riff and a pattern that is pretty much the same as something they already did on another record. And the song Brand New on Monochrome has the exact same odd pattern that Turned Out has on Meantime, which is that... That's a very specific timing. And he just does another song with the exact same timing with just slightly different notes. And I'm just like, did he not know? Did he forget? Like, is like, is he not a fan <laughs> of his music to where he just forgets that he wrote songs? And so he writes something. Maybe. Oh, that's an interesting timing. I should do that. Like, or was it supposed to harken back to turned out? But either way, it just makes me go, oh, you... Somebody should have said something. <laughs> they should have <laughs> stopped it before that happened. He might have forgotten that song in the coma and then written it again. There you, there you go. <laughs> um, but it's just a weird choice, even though it's an okay song. But but when those parts pop up on these later albums, I just go, is it an accident? Is he really that limited in his songwriting where he just pulls the same kind of riff again? Um, and some people may say that's what it is. Uh, but it's it's so weird that 
uh, just just to give everybody a little bit of a heads up, um, my demeanor towards Helmet is going to do a complete 180 in a couple albums, and you're going to hear me <laughs> really excitedly talking about music. And as it sounds like I'm just shitting all over this band, like why are we even doing this? Fuck Helmet, <laughs> but it's not the case. Um, but anyway, Monochrome feels like they 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 tried a little bit to make what is a bit a bit more of an aggressive album after size matters. And then, you know, previous to that aftertaste, which were a lot more, they had a more of a melody going on thing where monochrome has a little bit of that, but it's, it's definitely more aggressive. Yeah. And unfortunately the problem is the songwriting just isn't there. And so it doesn't really deliver in the way that you would hope. Like if somebody explained to me the, what the album sounded like, I'd be like, Oh, it sounds good. But it, for some reason it just doesn't connect. And then the, the song monochrome is another baffling moment on the album because it's a song where the songwriting and the riffs is exactly the same, not exactly the same, but it's the same vibe as other helmet songs where it's, you can tell it was meant to be played loud and heavy, but the distortion is turned way down and the, everything's played very understated, even though it's not a song that should be played that way. So it just sounds mm. like, it almost sounds like when they were recording that one, the neighbors were like, Hey, would you mind turning it down this evening? Because we're having a dinner party next door. And they're like, oh, okay. And so they just, well, this song monochrome is going to be like this. Da, da, da. You know, it's, you know it's just, it's, so it sounds like they, they just turned it down. What's the fucking reason behind that? Who the fuck knows? It's just <laughs> that we need this to sound differently. All right, just turn everything down a little bit. All right, cool, whatever, moving on. Um, but anyway, so it just makes it sound awkward. And... Um, Really, uh, th this is the last one that I'm going to talk a load of shit about because um, this is kind of where it starts with the production not being as good, the songs feeling less inspired, and um, the the I, I really just have to say it, even though even though the production on this is better, it's just not good for this album and the next two, and it just does the it, it, it does songs that are not as good they all they suffer again from just not feeling alive in the production. Um, but I have monochrome higher up just because it does have enjoyable moments um, here and there. They're just not all in one complete song. It's just little things here and there where I go, ah, that's cool. And then a chorus will happen and I go, oh, that's kind of a kind of whatever. Um, yeah. And this, this is, you know, We'll get to the next album, but there is a shift, and I think a lot of it I need to I would blame on his on his lyrics because his lyrics for the first three Helmet albums for sure were uh, like they were cryptic, like yeah. they they were written in a way, you know, kind of the way that you would hear that Kurt Cobain would write lyrics, where he they would say that he would write down things and then he would cut them up and rearrange them in a weird way. Well, sometimes he didn't clearly, but that's what helmet lyrics always felt like to me, where it was almost like taking things that didn't really sound like they went together, but still meant something anyway. And you could kind of make your own, you know, interpretation of what the lyrics meant, which is really fascinating when people can write that way. I can't write uh, lyrics that way. It's, it feels weird, but starting a little bit on aftertaste and then definitely in size matter matters all the way through the rest of the albums, the lyrics become very like he might as well be singing. This is a song about a guy that's mean. And that, that, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it, they're so straightforward. It's just, I, I get it. You're, you don't like a guy and he did something wrong. Um, <laughs> and so it, it, it takes, it takes away from it. All of those things just make these, um, the last three albums I've talked about, they just make them albums that I, I don't, I never go back to them. Um, but moving forward, there's a more of a positive spin on things, just a tiny bit of shit talking left, but I think I've gotten most of it out of my system. <laughs> so, uh, so that's my number six monochrome. Yeah. This is going to be one of those like big one eighty episodes where like the tone totally switches about halfway through. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen. Cool. Uh, so my number five, um, my favorite of the second incarnation of Helmet, Monochrome. Hey! So, uh, yeah, this album 
initially when I heard it right after, like when I turned it on after Size Matters, I thought, oh no, the production, the production was better on the previous album. But then I thought to myself, you know what, maybe you've just got listener fatigue. So I, I took my earphone, I took my headphones off, didn't listen to anything. I actually went and watched TV for about 20 minutes before I went back and listened to the next album. Because I feel as though I, I need to give myself some recharge time to be able to in, enjoy it as its own thing. Yeah. So uh, when I came back to it, I felt a little bit more refreshed. And uh, right out of the gate, it's got a similar feel to the previous record, but with a rawer sound. Um and much more heaviness and aggression mm-hmm. starting out with, you know, with swallowing everything. And then brand new it is, is more up tempo and angry sounding, you know, plus the prominent lead guitar parts are cool. Um, bury me goes off. That's got a killer groove monochrome. Pretty much. I've put here what you said, uh, in a little bit more of a cryptic way, I guess, um, monochrome, has a feel to it that feels remarkably different yet familiar to helmet sound and you could pretty much nail it down to the fact that this could have been heavier and it would have been much more helmet <laughs> yeah but it's 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 almost like it's still played the same way only softer yeah it's weird cool though you know it, it is cool to hear different dimensions but uh you know when you come to a band for a certain certain thing it can be frustrating to hear a song that could have sounded a little bit harder. Uh, On Your Way Down has a killer riff. Uh, which which track was it that had the... Oh, like, that's... W- which? That's... Um, uh, is it brand... I think it's brand new that has that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did like that, but I, I did recognize... This album does feel like a bit of an homage to their early stuff. You know, after the after they did a couple of really melodic uh, albums, but uh, where was I at? Money shot, ballad ish, cool change of pace. Gone is a punky up tempo track. Almost out of sight gave me modern ugly kid Joe vibes for some reason. I, I could see that. Yeah, it's 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 weird. I don't know how to describe it, but well, when I heard kid it, Joe, I was like, ugly kid Joe, especially on like kind of the middle area albums of ugly kid joe they had like a heavier alt, yeah. alt metal almost at times kind of feel to some of their tracks yeah especially so on I, I uh, the heavier moments of motel california you yeah. had that kind of thing going on mm-hmm. uh how go back, go back does, and listen to our ugly kid joe ranking which is available on your podcasting platforms and <laughs> <laughs> Um, Howl does what it says. It's straight up guitar noise. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like um, a total waste of time. I mean, it's like, what yeah. is, why is it even there? <laughs> um, it's it. That's that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Um, uh, four one zero or like four hundred ten feels like straight up helmet to be honest that track and then goodbye has groove and vibe and really this album for me monochrome is the best of the bunch best of the best of the bunch i was gonna say we got there i i i'm I'm running on i'm running on fumes i got about three hours sleep last night but um yeah the it's the best of the later Helmet albums, in my opinion. Cool. So um, moving on to my number five, it's going to get a little bit more positive, but I, I, have to, I have to be picky in order to cast the, the blame for what happened on the next three albums for Helmet. Um, so Size Matters is my number five. I'm just going backwards in their albums now. I was going to say, there's a there's a distinctly reverse chronological it, yeah. thing going on here. Which doesn't say much <laughs> for a band when their albums, as they go on, get worse, in my opinion. So, But that's just me. <laughs> um, the first thing to say, because you know, Size Matters was the first album that Helmet did since After Taste in 1997. So what it, what it, that was a seven-year gap, something like that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it, and I remember that you know when it came out, I was ready because I loved Helmet, and I was like, oh shit, Helmet's back! Fuck yeah! And I think the first song that I heard off of it was See You Dead, I think was the first one. And it, this was back in 2004. And I just went, no. Like I was, because it wasn't <laughs> bad, but it was like, I don't, what are they doing? Because it was, this was 2004. So the kind of music that they had sort of started had gotten popular with all these other bands doing these helmet style things in their songs, which, in, which ended up, you know, leading into, you know, rap metal and, and, and all those kind of new metal and stuff like that. So when I heard that, I was just like, this isn't, you guys need to come back and show everybody how it's done. Not just do an album that could easily get lost in all the other shit that's going on in 2004. Um, but the production on this album to me is great. I think it sounds really good. Um, I guess it has to be the fact that they were on a major label and then all of a sudden starting on monochrome, they were on indies. So, um, that's probably part of it, but, um, this is the first with a different lineup. Um, interestingly enough, uh, for the tour cycle for this album, at least for some of it, uh, Frank Bello from Anthrax was the bass player in helmet, but he doesn't play on the album. Um, so there's, there are some strong songs on here, but the one thing that seems very clear as you listen to size matters. It's that Paige Hamilton is mad at a girl. There's, yeah. there's a lot of angst towards a woman. And I don't know how much weight to put into this as being a fact, but it's on their wiki and I've read it other places too, that, the lyrics on this album all stemmed from Paige Hamilton's failed relationship with Winona Ryder. Yeah. So all of a sudden his lyrics become very angry dude who got dumped and, (laughs) and they've never recovered from that. It almost seems like every album he's mad at some woman who did something to him and it's always the same thing, and, and, and it just makes me go, is Paige Hamilton one of those dudes that's just a <laughs> dick? He's a dick, and then the women break up with him, and he's like, oh, that bitch! And then, I'm going to write that <laughs> song about that bitch! And then, like, he writes a song. And I just feel like I, I love Winona Ryder. She's great. She, I, I, she, was, a, she, was, a, she was, you know... In the in the 90s, she was a, a crush of mine, you know? So I totally, I'm like, of course you hooked up with Monona Ryder. But I'm a little mad at her because I think she fucked up this band. I think she fucked up, that was the, that's the coma we're talking about. I think <laughs> his relationship with her fucked him up to the point where he forgot how to do shit good. <laughs> Damn. So, and lyrically, it just becomes like it's not just the songs about about women. Like I said, it could be about anything. His 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 lyrics all of a sudden become they sound like they were just written right before he went into to doing the vocals, and he was mad about something, and he just wrote it down, and and then that was that was the song. They just sound so pedestrian um, compared to the older style of his lyrics. So that being said. That's kind of my last bit of chit talking because that's kind of the only thing that drags this album down and doesn't see it higher up because songwriting wise, like riffs, the performances of the, the, the band that he has on here, which you got to give a shout out to John Tempestra on drums, um, which, you know, that dude is, he's played with a shit ton of people. And um, not, not to mention, you know, uh, in, in my world, uh, he played with Exodus. He played with Testament Um, so, um, but, um, so yeah, anyway, so where was I? Oh yeah. Yeah. The band's good. The performances are great. The production's great. The songs sound alive and full and I'm okay with the lyrics on this one because for some reason it sounds like an album that he needed to get out. He went through some shit. He's getting it out. And I like albums like that. If the other three albums hadn't followed in the way that they did, this album might be higher up because it, it wouldn't just be, a 
a reminder of, oh, here's where it goes. Here's where it goes from here. Yeah. Um, because the songs on it. here, <laughs> yeah, because the songs on here, they're heavy, they're aggressive, but they're also really enjoyable. And the one thing I do like is that they didn't turn their backs on, because because Aftertaste, the previous album, wasn't as well received as their previous three, but they didn't, he didn't, Paige Hamilton didn't turn his back on the melodic side of things, which I got to give him props for, because there's still yeah. melodies in there, there's catchy hooks in some of the songs. Um, and this is, you know, it's a little more straightforward when it comes to Helmet, which I think was the thing that was disappointing at the time, not just for me, but for a lot of big fans, because it was very straightforward. The For the most part, the odd time signatures were kind of gone. You still had the starts and stops of the riffs and stuff, but um, it was less adventurous. And um, even and on this particular album, there, there's a Helmet boo-boo where uh, the song Drug Lord has the exact same sounding verse as smart. It just, it may, it makes me go, <laughs> did I go back to the beginning of the album again? Which is just another one of those things. I'm all like, he, it, I can understand four albums apart from each other. He doesn't remember something he wrote, but I'm like, dude, this is the same album, same album, same album. <laughs> I guess I'm still shit talking. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but there's, but you know, I already went into that. There's a lot of samey things that start happening from this point on. And, um, while it, 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 I do at this point enjoy this album in, in when it first came out, I didn't like it, but it did grow on me. This is one that did grow on me. And I think the strong moments outweigh the weak moments, but the weak moments are absolutely there. Um, but overall, you know, in hindsight, looking back at this album, I'm like, well, yeah, this is, I'll take this album over anything else. This is my favorite of the 2000s era helmet. And unfortunately it didn't get better, but then that's why it is my number five. And this concludes the, um, shit talking portion of this episode <laughs> of cranked and ranked. All right. Well then, um, now we're on to our top four, the halfway mark. Um, I'm excited to, this is, I, I see, I, this is a band that I'm, sometimes I'm very excited to talk, to you about this music because this is a great example of me having such deep emotions towards music music that I've been <laughs> with since the early nineties and you came onto it later. So sometimes it's good to get this different perspective because sometimes I feel like I'm overly harsh because there is that emotional connection that I have to this music. So with that, with that being said, let's move on to your number four. So I, I, I just want to follow up what you said as well there with, uh, you know, how I, as a, as a 20 years younger person, how I discovered and connected with this music and stuff. Um, Helmet, for me, is an even more recent thing than death. Because, you know, I said I got into death about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Helmet connected with me properly one year ago. So, like, literally last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know what it was. It was just, I, I woke up one day and I was like, I want to get into another band from the GTA San Andreas soundtrack. Who am I going to pick? And because I was in kind of a grungy, heavier mood at the time, I was like, okay. You've gotten into Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Living Color. Uh, oh, Helmet. Let's try Helmet out. And uh, yeah, listen to Meantime front to back. Fucking loved it. Had no idea why I hadn't listened to it. Yeah. At least fucking seven years before I did, you know? And um, all, all I know is like, I heard you mention Living Color. I'm like, oh, can we do them? Can we do them? Oh, hell yeah. We're, we're going to do Living Color at all some right. point. Com coming soon. Yeah. Living Color. <laughs> um so yeah I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do my number four now. Num numero uh, cuatro. So here we have my number four, Aftertaste. Okay. Okay, so Aftertaste is is the last of the original run. 
and uh, it's probably the most melodic of the original run too. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I do, I'm gonna do my track by track. Do uh, it. Pure, you know, starts the record with a catchy groover. Renovation is is quite a sing along track in the vocal melody department. Um, <laughs> exactly what you wanted feels like Nine Inch Nails went full on grunge. <laughs> <laughs> like I hear Trent Reznor when I hear that song. Um, like I care has has groove and vibe in equal measure. You'll know I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Driving nowhere is some serious nineties grungeage, dude. Um, the, it, this album, despite being released in the late nineties, is very grunge influenced. I feel this is of their nineties work. This is the grungiest, I think. I think it because it leans more on the alternative side of their sound as opposed to the noise rock yeah. or post hardcore sound. If this is very alternative for them. Yeah, so I, I, I guess that would be why. Uh, then you get b- birth defect. At this point, I'm hearing some, you know, outside influence from the grunge scene. Like I say, uh, broadcast emotion has this like new metal ballad feel. Notice when whenever I say ballad, it's always accompanied with like ballad, but not a ballad or metal ballad. It's it's because they never they never really step away from loud. No. Just varying degrees of it. I mean, yeah, uh, if you're using the word ballad and you mean like, you know, uh, every rose has its, has its thorn, <laughs> that's a very, it's a very bro. different thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's I, I just don't know how to describe these like slower, slightly more emotional songs. Um, it's easy to get bored. Uh, the vocals really are much more melodic here than previous records. And I think that that song title does the album a disservice when it comes to (laughs) later Helmet albums. (laughs) Um, But yeah, yeah, um, Dire Aftertaste is an upbeat punky track and Harmless is another one. Uh, High or high visibility is tasty as hell. And insatiable is bouncy as all hell, you know. And and Crisis King closes out the record with an up tempo, noisy track, reminiscent at times of the earliest of their albums. But yeah, this is a if you want '90s Helmet but slightly more melodic, this is the album for you. It's it's probably their most accessible at the time absolutely i believe that is actually in my notes that i said it was the most accessible helmet album yeah because like if if you show someone the solo to iron head they're going to be like what the fuck <laughs> and, and, un, unless they have a pretty like open mind but um yeah it's a good album it's a good album Awesome, and so I'm gonna ring the I'm gonna ring the bell. Ding, ding, ding. We have a matchup, everyone. Uh, my hey. number four is uh, if you're playing at home. Um, I don't know if you're play, if you're betting on the odds or whatever, but you know you're 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 doing we well at to, this point. We need to make a bingo game for the old head bangers um, group. That would be that would be cool. All like right. whenever get, get I get to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like all of our phrases and all of the shit we do. So. Uh, I, that's yeah, that's be, actually not a bad idea. Um, it's like uh, Eddie. Uh, either one of us messes up a line. That's that's like a yeah. that's that's one. Uh, Eddie mentions GTA San Andreas. <laughs> that's <laughs> another, that's another good one. <laughs> Steven says so. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And I say, but yeah. <laughs> God, if well, this either, was a either, drinking either, game, either one of us says cool. <laughs> <laughs> or does a Beavis and Butthead impersonation? <laughs> that, well, yeah, we have to have things that are more rare. You know, yeah, Steve, Stephen does a D's nuts joke. <laughs> that's that's more rare. <laughs> anyway, so um, yes, my number four is also Aftertaste from 1997, the last of the original lineup of the band. Um, even though this one, um, I think, was recorded as a three piece because the other second guitar player had quit by this point, but the rhythm section of uh, Henry Bodgen um, 
Bogdan, I always say that wrong, or and uh, and John Stanier um, are here, and those dudes fucking rule. And mm. and when this album came out in 1997, Helmet um, w- was easily in my top five favorite bands of all time. Um, I was obsessed with their first three albums as well as the uh, compilation uh, called Born Annoying. And so um, this was a highly anticipated album. And I remember um, you would sometimes at some record stores, you would go to like use CD stores and radio stations or publications or wherever would get early advanced copies that were like cutout copies with a little hole punched in the case yeah. or the jacket. And I happened to find a version of this album before it came out at a used CD store. Um, no it was, way. it was only by a couple weeks, I think, but I remember getting it and being like, Holy fuck, man. I was so stoked and it was hard for me to get into it initially. Um, the, this is a, this is the first album where, um, his lyrics become a little more straightforward and there's a lot more melody. It's a lot more leaning on the alternative side of their sound. And I liked the heavy stuff. So at first it was a little bit kind of uncomfortable, but, um, I ended up really getting into it pretty quick. And, um, even though it does sort of leave behind the kind of noise rock side of things, it still is a pretty fucking heavy album. And like we said, the most accessible, this this is not a bad entry point. If you're not a into helmet, um, aftertaste is a, is is a pretty good place to start. I would say start this here and work your way backwards, um, yeah. and then jump to the other ones if you are interested enough. Um, I do think that the big thing about this album is that every song on this album is good, but only a few of them are great. And, um, so there's, there's a, there's a few sort of uninspired moments, like listening to it in hindsight, I almost feel like I can hear the whole band, not really being a hundred percent into doing it anymore. Like it almost seemed like a breakup was yeah. imminent. You can kind of hear it in some of the songs and, um, uh, yeah, I don't really have a lot more to add from what you said because the, you, the, the songs are great. There's the, um, it's one of those things where the the leaving behind the sort of urgency of strapping on in meantime and the kind of experimentation that worked in Betty, those things are kind of left behind. So helmet uh, doesn't the helmet sound doesn't come across as well in this album to me, but um, it's still good. Uh, it's, it, this is a, if they had, if they had left off here and never gone back to doing helmet, I think I'd feel a lot differently about this album. In fact, I did, I did prior to 2004. I, I, it it had grown to be an album that I'm like, Oh, why, why does nobody give any praise to aftertaste? It's good. But they, they fucked it up. Winona Ryder fucked it up. You know, (laughs) that's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to blame it on her. Anyway, um, so yeah, <laughs> Aftertaste is a, is a good Winona album. killed Helmet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, she killed Christian Slater in Heathers, spoiler alert, and she killed Helmet. <laughs> <laughs> if you, a spoiler alert for a 30-year-old film, it's like <laughs> even more so, I think. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, it's just, it's it's good. It's just not great. Um and uh, but all the rest of the albums that we're going to talk to are great, so I'm anxious to move on. So let's let's skip forward to your number three, sir. Cool. So this is where we we hit like kind of the the golden trilogy. The, fo- the fog clears, and <laughs> it's a it's a, a rainbow appears. <laughs> <laughs> so so it begins the holy trifecta. Uh, so my number three. I've gone for strap it on. All right. See, at this point, any combination for the for these three, I'm like, I'm cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's the 1990 debut record. Mm-hmm. It's totally new and fresh approach to heavy music at the time with their, you know, drop D staccato riff style. And 
really, when I think about other albums from 1990, I and I'm re- I'm really racking my brain now. I can't think of anything else that sounds like it. The closest, I've, the closest is Prong. Prong, yeah. Prong had a. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it prove not prove you wrong? Prove you wrong was ninety one. I think. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Beg to differ. Uh, That's the by one. Prong had come out. I think the same year, either either eighty nine or ninety. And, Could be, and so, but that's the only. That's it, and and so you know, uh, there there may have been like indie bands that were doing things that um, just weren't on my radar. But as far as I know, this was, you know, a pretty fresh sound. Yeah, it it's really interesting to hear, especially considering the time. Like this was the point at which, like you think in nineteen ninety, before grunge took over from hair metal. Um, mm-hmm. the biggest kind of thing really was the power ballad, you know? So to have something come out that's so belligerently aggressive sounding, mm-hmm. it, it was like a massive breath of fresh air. Also, quick little bit of Eddie's live research. Uh, Beg to Differ by Prong was released in 1990. Yeah. So, uh... Yeah, that's that's cool. Another we'll fucking great. Pro- we'll, we're gonna, we'll get to prong eventually for sure. Totally. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> starting off. Yeah, we we got uh, repetition. Is is this raw, odd sounding groover that utterly pummels the listener? Yeah, I can't begin to imagine what people made of this at the time, considering the genres of the day would have been kind of your glam and your thrash and the early stages of grunge coming into the mainstream with maybe like uh, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. But this is just so fucking raw and and brutal sounding, in, a, in not in like a death metal way, but in more of a... Oh, it's just hits a fucking yeah th- this album to me is like it, it almost has a quality of like a a, a brick bring th- being thrown up against a wall it's like yeah. <laughs> it just it's a very it's a it's a raw and pummeling kind of sound yeah i'd i'd say like even like this is like the the audio equivalent of of throwing a brick through a massive glass window cuz yeah. like there are just some really banging sections to these songs. Uh, you know, Rude starts very straight ahead, but then develops into an absolute groove fest. Bad Mood reminds me of another song that came out around that time. You know, give back my alcohol, give back oh. my alcohol. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and f- funny enough, I around that time um, you would I, I read some stuff about how Kurt Cobain was really into this album. Like he he was totally into Helmet, and I think they toured with Helmet. I think Nirvana <laughs> and Helmet played shows together, um, which yeah. that would have been fucking great. In fact, why, in fact, I think they came through Austin. It was Helmet and Nirvana, and I was like too young to go. But I think that's one oh. of those shows that like I hear about and I go, God damn it, that would have been amazing. Yeah, that, that sounds fucking rad. <laughs> um, Sinatra has has this nasty, laid back groove to it, with just some even nastier, gnarly, dissonant guitars. That's a that's a thing. Sinatra is a song that's it's kind. They kind of don't ever do a song like that again. They do yeah. they do things that are I guess close, but Sinatra is like a mood. It's a mood. Like there's yeah. no chorus. And it's the only difference differences between like it's all the same melody or like melody. It's all the same riffs, just one with a whole bunch of noise, and then one with some more sort of open discordant kind of guitar melody, and then the more rhythmic uh power chord stuff. But it's like it just creates this mood that's so tense. And and they didn't do that a lot, but man, they they nailed it with that song. Yeah, it, it, it's a really cool, very experimental sounding album as well. You know, FBLA, they have a real knack for making noisy ass random solos work for some reason. Yeah. Uh, it, it's one of those, it's one of those things, um, 
my friend actually, uh, Dan, mentioned to me a while back, and it kind of reminds me of what he said about uh, Larry uh, Lalonde from... Um, is that his name? From from Primus and, and Possessed. I, he has a way of playing stuff that should sound wrong. Yeah. And does, yeah. but works. <laughs> yeah, I, and, I, I would actually blame Paige Hamilton for me not becoming a better guitar player. Because <laughs> I was never interested... Like, by the time I was playing music and writing songs, I wasn't interested in having a, so- a solo in my song that was... I just wanted to be like... <laughs> I wanted to make noise that didn't really, that played on its own, sounded awful, but in the context of the song, created a mood. And so, like, yeah. that's always been, I've never been a guy that solos on guitar. I'm a rhythm guitar player. But when I do, it's, I love just making some fucking noise on the guitar. And so <laughs> it's, all, it's all his fault. It's Paige Hamilton's fault. <laughs> we're, we're, we're putting a lot of blame out in this episode aren't we? <laughs> that's all right i just you know some, sometimes i feel like we just need to get it off our chest if you know the, the, sometimes blame needs to be pointed in order to uh, for some sort of catharsis i think i think it feels good yeah agreed uh blacktop has some upbeat intensity but its strength again lies in the more laid-back groove sections uh, distracted is just more tasty, odd sounding groovage. Um, pardon me. God, that was so British then. My God, I did a, I did a, I did a burp. Pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any gray poupon? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> make room is, is, is fun and swingy without forsaking the band's core sound. And then you get murder which is a brutal, all-out assault on the listener, barraging you with as much dissonance and groove the band can throw at you. It's, it's sound, which, it, the name is fitting. Like yeah. It's like the sonic equivalent of a murder. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's pretty frightening. They nailed moods on, on this album. Yeah. And, and I feel like Murder is the ultimate climax to this record uh, because it... it spends about half hour killing you and then it finally does yeah. you know <laughs> it's a, and it's you know a 32 minute album almost 33 minutes in length yeah um or no Short no no wait the no it's only 30 there you go yeah yeah i'm looking at the one with the japanese bonus track which i don't have that i have to have the original but um um go ahead and uh, get your bingo cards ready cuz we uh have another matchup <laughs> <laughs> Now, th- this one, my number two and number three um, switched twice, I think. Wow. And uh, Strap It On ended up falling here at number three. This is, at a, this is w- a good example of it. Could this could just be a joint number one, three-part number one for me. Yeah. Because while I didn't discover Helmet on Strap It On, I quickly went back and bought it once I got into Mean Time. And I just love, I love this, some of those um, 80s and 90s sort of more indie heavy albums, they have this quality about them where it feels like you're discovering something that other people don't know. Yeah, and, I know that feel. And um, Strap It On feels like that every time I listen to it. Like it feels like a like music that was not intended for the mainstream by any stretch of the imagination, but um, but would end up influencing tons of bands that were fully mainstream. Um, um, so yeah, I, I really do think that there was nothing like this album at the time even though prong had similar aesthetics when it came to the sort of stop start um kind of riffs and the rhythmic kind of stuff but i think strap it on just is it's 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 its own beast and it's a it's so weird how it's it is one it's one of those albums that if i try to describe it i have to use so many different terms yeah cuz it's like heavy odd noise rock slash metal slash post hardcore it's like because it doesn't yeah. fit it doesn't fit anywhere 
Um, but it's one of those albums that a metalhead could easily be into and somebody that's really into uh, Melvin's or like Jesus Lizard or something like that, the more sort of odd independent kind of stuff would also be into this. It's like the the meeting of the of the of the the Heshers and the and the art school kids. <laughs> <laughs> they could come together um for strap it on. And um I love the raw production on this one. So that's the thing that's so interesting to me because you can have an album that has a very raw production, but it's done in a way that the album still has a life to it. So I don't, yeah, that, that's big. why, yeah, that's why with those, uh, those last few helmet albums, I kept using the word dry. Cause that's the only thing I can think of that makes it sound less exciting. It just sounds so compressed. Like they just recorded it in a closet and then that, that's all it is. This sounds like it's in a, a big ass warehouse. Um, and it's not, mm. it doesn't sound great, but it has like a, a very big quality to it. And this one is when it comes to the sort of odd, like discordant riffs, like this is the most that they used those and yeah. just the odd time signatures and the interesting interplay between the drums and the guitars. Um, they just had that shit nailed by album number one. And um, to me, this is, I feel like this is a groundbreaking album and I feel like a whole lot of bands would agree um, I mean, later later on, you had like the Deftones covered Sinatra. I'm sure other bands have covered Sinatra too. Um, but there's, it is just 30 minutes of just pure fuck your shit up in a way that you didn't expect to be fucked up <laughs> kind of album. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's just, a, it's just a fucking classic. So, um, so, but um, at the end, when we get to the next album, I'll explain like I, why that one ended up being number two, and this one's number three for Strap It On. Let's let's see if we continue to match up. This is exciting. I think we will, because my number two is Betty. Ow! Oh! <laughs> that was a weird noise that could go either way. <laughs> I like that I made yeah. that noise. <laughs> <laughs> What, I know wait, what, what you mean because mean? I, I I did convey that it's like a confused negative affirm affirmation. It's like <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. Just just start talking about Betty. Cool. Which is my mom um, my mom's name, by the way. Oh, that's 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 sweet. <laughs> shout, shout out to my mom who won't listen to this. <laughs> so um yeah, uh, Betty, it's it's quite an experimental record in, in a different way to how um, Strap It On was. Uh, mm -hmm. This one tries out a lot of different stuff, um, but still has a core sound. And I think the cool thing about this is it's one of those like kind of Faith No More deals where it's like the band has a core sound, but they defy categorization in a cool way. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, yeah, Wilma's Rainbow is a seriously catchy number and a good choice for an opener. Mm -hmm. When that riff kicks in, it is truly fucking thunderous. Um, then you get I Know has Helmet's <sighs> trademark groove under some cool vibey parts before going hard as fuck. That, that, like, it, that, that yeah. uh, sometimes I feel like not only do they write a great riff, but they pick the exact um, BPMs or whatever to to, yeah. to fit it at, so the groove just feels so fucking good. And once that <laughs> kicks in, and I know, dur, 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 once that shit kicks in, I'm just, oh my <laughs> god, how much more perfect could a song be? Totally. Um, you know, biscuits for smut has a has a funky, almost rage against the machine kind of thing going on. Milk Toast is a tune. Yeah. Love that song. Uh, it was in the soundtrack for The Crow as well, wasn't it? It was. That was where it first came out. So prior to this album ever coming out, there was a version of Milk Toast on The Crow soundtrack. So, um, and I was already into that song. Fuck, that song rules. <laughs> uh, Tick 
has a mean fucking groove to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rolla has a more upbeat yet still visceral groove that's impossible to not move to. You know, I found myself... I, have you seen those uh, Try Not to Headbang Challenge videos on I, YouTube? I know about them, but I've never actually watched one because I, I remember like watching a Try Not to Laugh video with my daughter, and I was just like, none of this is funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, This is the easiest challenge ever. So I have a feeling it's going to be Try Not to Headbang, and then it's going to be like a Creed song. I'm going to be like, oh, that's pretty fucking easy. <laughs> it, yeah. I I think you'll find they they pick some damn good they pick some damn good tracks on on those little challenges. Maybe there. I, maybe I should do that. I'll do a video of me doing a try not to headbang challenge. Yeah, they're pre- fr- from the ones I've done. They're they're pretty well curated, but there's there's a shitload of them out there. So, right. uh, but yeah, um, Street Crab has a nice laid back but heavy feel to it. Uh, clean now, clean. I love that wet sounding vocal effect. Yeah. I don't know what it is about it, but it conjures up that kind of come as you are chorus kind of vibe. Yeah. Love that. Everything about stuff that sounds wet is stuff I fucking love. Well, they, well, and, they, and that's, that's a good, that's a the thing about this album is the fact that this is the first one where they did start playing around with these effects like studio effects, like it was branching out and trying different things on the vocals and the sound of the, not, not just in the songwriting, because there are songs that on this album are very different from the first two, but just yeah. choices like that to add that effect to the vocals is something that didn't, didn't happen on the first two records. Yeah. It, it, it's just so cool to hear all of these songs. I'd say this is, a, this is a pretty significant step in their discography because I suppose, like, Meantime is a little beefier than um, Strap Betty. It On. Oh, straight, yeah, yeah, Strap It On. But Betty is, like, they foray into the melody, but they don't forsake the heavy shit, too. So, Well, the thing that I, I've noticed is that not every song, but it's almost like when there's a melodic part, like vocal wise on, on Betty underneath it is usually some sort of really weird chords being played. So it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't come across as melodic as it actually is because there's still that level of, of unease discord or whatever happening underneath it that, um, that that's why it's done so perfectly on this album. Totally. Um, vaccination has a cool riff which at points feels hard to keep up with but in a good way like it it, i love especially as a drummer i love hearing stuff that confuses me you know i like thinking whoa what like yeah (laughs) um beautiful love is a cheeky little smooth jazz piece as if to say yeah we can also do this but now check out this noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Spe- speechless is one of the more slow and nasty grooves. You know, I, I just love probably the catchiest I, chorus on the album too. I think. Yeah. Like there's, I, I think I've used the word groove in most of my notes here, <laughs> especially on this album. And you know, the silver Hawaiian has a, a CD dark, almost hip-hop-esque groove to it yeah um overrated is slow and vibey love me some of that and sam hell is a weird primus-esque hillbilly jam to close out the record i fucking love this album yeah it's re- it's really cool I fucking love it too. And so get ready because we have our first ever, I think, four time matchup because obviously wow. we're matching up here, which means we also matched up on our number one. That's a first on Crank to yeah. Rank. The whole bottom half or top half of the ranking was exactly the same. My number two is Betty. This album was so highly anticipated by me and it was only increased by hearing milk toast when it was put out on the crow soundtrack. Yeah. So when this came out, this was one of those uh, situations where 
the album came out and I didn't have enough money. So I bought the cassette version of it. And because I would at this point it was already I'd already moved over to CDs, but occasionally I would really want an album and I'd be like, fuck, all I have is all I have is nine dollars. I don't have you know, 14, 13 or 14 or whatever it was. <laughs> and so I got this on cassette and I I'm I probably wore that fucker out. Like I don't I don't have it anymore, but I just I I this one from the get-go was an album that I'm just like, this is amazing. This is exactly where I wanted them to go without really knowing that because I couldn't have predicted this album because it still has all of the heaviness. The production yeah. is great. It sounds amazing. There's, there's great riffs. You've got the weird chords. You've got the odd time signatures. You've got the, the stop-start staccato kind of shit that you love, but it has this other level of experimentation while not like people use the word experimental for this album. And I go, there are legit experimental albums that, you know, you could use that word on this one. Yeah. That's using that term lightly for helmet. Yeah. This is experimental just with the, <laughs> the, the songs that kind of take little left turn turns, you know, I would even throw biscuit biscuits for smut in that um, category because that song it's a little, it's weird. It doesn't sound like any other helmet song. So you get, you know, an idea from song number three that, oh, they're going to be throwing in some like different shit along with this kind of expanded helmet sound. Um, so I agree. This is a step forward from meantime. Um, and this, this was the album that solidified them as one of my favorite bands. Once, once Betty came out, um, they were up there with you know Metallica as a band that I'm just like I'll buy anything that they put out, um, and I also love the variety of songs on this because it doesn't really it it doesn't get boring um, because it there's enough different shit going on either sonically or just in the actual songwriting that just keeps it so interesting all the way through. This is just like wall to wall great songs. And, um, this goes, this, we're now back in the, you know, talking about strap it on and Betty, and then we'll get to the next one. Um, I was always just really fascinated by the, the, the lyrical style that Paige Hamilton had on these albums, where it just seems as soon as you think you understand a song from two lines, the next two lines, you're just like, what the fuck was that? It's very yeah. cryptic. And, um, what, wh whether it was you know, cryptic on a level where he had some sort of a thought process and it was actually meticulously put together, or if he just grabbed words and threw them together, I don't really care because, um, it, it sounds cool. <laughs> it sounds cool. And it allows you to come up with your own interpretation of lyrics, as opposed to somebody hitting you overhead with over the head with a concept and saying, here's what this is yeah. about. Listen to it. Um, so it makes the, it fits better with their music. To, to not have such direct, straightforward lyrics. But um, Betty is just... <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 I second everything that you said. This is just uh, an album, that to me, that never gets old. It, I, I feel the same every time I listen to it. It's just... It's, it's, so, it's so great. And it's... And 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 it and it has that thing where where they did something different and it worked, and it's just unfortunate that later on when they tried to do different things it didn't work as well. In my opinion, of course, there may be people out there that that um, prefer later Helmet albums, and that's different but um, interesting. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so so yeah, um, my number two is Betty, 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 Betty. <laughs> Cool. So do you wanna do you wanna say the number one with me? Let's do it. Okay. Three, two, one. Meantime. meantime. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> meantime. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank God it's so it's so interesting. So we've never I think we've I don't we're, I don't know how much we've matched up on other ones, but definitely not four in a row. That's never happened. Yeah, before. this is a this is a this is a big event. This is the grand finale of 2020. We're uh, we're wrapping up 2020 with uh, 
with a first, a cranked and ranked first. <laughs> All right, so awesome. let's do it. Let's do it. Fucking a classic, game changing, influential record in the true sense of the word. Yeah, you know it. it took the formula of the previous record refined it gave it a tighter and beefier sound and it paid the fuck off like this album is phenomenal and all of the songs it it's one of those albums that to me is like i can i can listen to uh, i can listen to tracks off of it but if i hear one track i have to hear the whole album yeah. You know, if I have that option and I've got like, like how long is the album? Like 30 to 40 minutes? Uh, 30, 30, almost 37 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> I need to dedicate about 40 minutes of my time to just say, hey, you just thought of the song unsung. You can't hear that one without <laughs> hearing the rest of this. So just, just whack it on and listen to the whole fucking thing because it rules. Um, so yeah, in the meantime, phenomenal opener. Ah, yeah. Killer riff. You know, that groove is second to none. Um, Iron Head gives us a one, two punch of staccato groovage. Give it really shows off the strength of the drums from, uh, John Stainer or, or Stanier. Or what's Sta- it? Stanier, I think. St- Stanier. Okay. Yeah, because I've been trying to I've been trying to figure out how to say it this past week. <laughs> I could have just typed it into Google Translate. Probably would <laughs> probably would have told me, but uh, yeah, unsung. You know, my first exposure to Helmet. Uh, you know, from GTA San Andreas. Awesome song, and I think it's cool as well that you and I got into this band through the same song. Yeah, but on top of that, if anyone's going to get into Helmet. That's probably the first song they're gonna hear. Most likely, yeah. You you look up yeah. helmet. That's the song that I think comes up first. Yeah, um, turned out is another staccato, odd time groove fest. He feels bad. Follows that up with more tasty moments. You know, better has one of those like polyrhythmic riffs that changes which notes it accents over the beat of the song. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so amazing. So they would do things like that. Like it's the first time I remember hearing a riff. Like let's let's say the riff was written in three four time, but it's played over a four four drum beat. Like they would do yeah. things like that, where they would things that didn't fit would fit in some sort of odd way that was done so well that you didn't even really think about it until you really started to listen. You're like, oh shit, yeah. If I'm trying to like if you're trying to learn it on guitar. And then you're like, this, yeah, this is totally doesn't really go. They they somehow took these two opposite rhythms and threw them together and it ended up working. And that's they do that shit all the time. Do you think it just came naturally to them as a unit, or Paige Hamilton was just really fucking good at math? <laughs> I, I if I remember right, his his background was more of like a jazz guitar player, yeah, I think. True. And so I think just you know just odd rhythms and stuff. I think that it was just him bringing that, that part of, I guess, jazz or, or other kinds of music. Cause obviously there was other music that was already progressive with odd time signatures and stuff. So I'll, it may have been that he was influenced by some of that stuff, but in the, in the context of heavy, brutal music, I don't think it had been done at least not this good. Yeah. It's, it's just got such a good, fucking sound that just works yeah um you borrowed has one of the meanest bouncy riffs on here um fbla2 uh is it future business leaders of america that uh, stand I, for i believe so yeah yeah it's it's a sequel track huh you know that's cool especially when <laughs> both tracks fucking rule yeah, and um, but but you know it doesn't matter. It's not like he sings FBLA two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was a, that was a Metallica dig where I didn't even need to do one. <laughs> Got some hot takes on this episode, Dad. <laughs> and but, I like that um, song. That's the one thing that like that's why I I feel confident in M- Metallica being my favorite band of all time because I will still poke some fun at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whenever I get a chance. 
Oh, man. So Role Model closes out this massive game-changing album with its menacing, furious riffage. And, you know, if if there's any list of Helmet albums, this it's got to be number one. It's got to be. I could see Betty being somebody's number one, but um, True. not on this show. Our joint number one is, is Meantime. <laughs> so... From my Our point joint of view, top four. Yeah, joint top four. <laughs> um, using the word influential on this album for me is the biggest understatement I've ever made. It is this album, because I started playing guitar, I think the year after, it was either 93 or 94. I think it was 93 when I first started playing guitar. And I learned a lot of Nirvana songs I learned a little bit of like Sabbath and Metallica, but the bulk of my learning other people's songs was from this album because it was just wow. so much fun to play. So I would have my amp yeah. set up in my room and I would crank the stereo and I would play meantime from beginning to end. And I would just play along with the album and it just felt good. And so ever since then, like anything that I've ever done musically whatever band I was in or project I did, there's always something somewhere that sounds like it could be part of a helmet song. It's just yeah. part of my DNA now. And yeah, this album came out and just totally blew me away. I would, I would hold this up with, you know, Nirvana, nevermind as a game changer for me because yeah. nevermind was influential because it sort of led me down the path of, Oh, I could do a rock band and then this was like, well, here's the kind of shit that you would really like to play. And honestly, you could just put those two together. You could put Nirvana and Helmet together, and that's kind of that's kind of me. <laughs> that's me as a songwriter right there. I feel like that's where I fit somewhere in between those two. Um, but you're you're right. I mean, there's so many standout tracks. Honestly, the first half of this album may be one of my favorite first halves ever. In the meantime, all the way through turned out. It is just five unfuckwithable songs in a row. And the, yeah. second, the second half ain't too shabby either. Um, but uh, yeah, but I, I have to give, you know, I talked about Turned Out earlier because there's that sound alike song on a later album. But Turned Out was one of the first songs where I started thinking about the mathematics behind riffs. Because the riff yeah. is and I was just always like, how, what? And so that was the funnest one to learn how to play. Because once I nailed that, I was like, oh, this is cool. And um, it's just, God, this album just is just, it's one of the best albums ever. This is this is one of my top ten favorite albums of all time, and um. I'm 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 with you in the fact that if I hear one song off of this album, I have to hear the whole album. And um it's it's aged so well. It doesn't yeah. sound it doesn't sound like an old album to me. If it came out today, I think people would lose their shit. In fact, well, I mean, there's a band out now that does stuff that sounds similar to this, that they're they're called Wrong. And their first EP and first album literally sound like lost helmet albums and i'm gonna load them up right now on spotify and save them yeah Where are they wrong are yeah they wrong and then the cool. the out the, there's a self-titled album i think and then the ep i think is called stop giving um there's cool. a second album they did that i didn't like near as much as the first two but they're still really good but I'm, i swear I'm getting, you're gonna put it on I'm getting helmet vibes from the fucking artwork, dude. Yeah. I could already, yeah. Oh, like, dude, you don't even you don't even know. You're gonna t you're gonna play it and you'd be like, holy <laughs> fuck, dude. It's like it's literally like they fit right in between um uh strap it on and meantime. They they somehow they it's really heavy wow. and the the stop start riffs are there, the discordant weird solo parts are there. It's you know you could even say it's some it, they are kind of borrowing from some helmet songs directly but you know what if Paige Hamilton can do it somebody else can do it too <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, so no shit. I'm not supposed to be shit talking anymore. We're talking about <laughs> mean time. So something interesting that I. This I, is nice time. <laughs> nice time. Um, something interesting that I don't know if this is, if this is necessarily true, but I read somewhere that mean uh, mean time is one of the first heavy albums where a vocalist used dual style vocals like where they yeah. ye- they yelled at one point and then they sang the next part you know you hear that a lot now where yeah. a, cor- a verse yeah. will be like oh, i'm screaming this part and then the the chorus comes and it'll be like and eh, now i'm singing like like i don't know if anybody did that prior to this like were there bands that yelled and then sang in the same song i was gonna say yeah that that does strike me like it if you were like kind of a thrash band, you had a straight ahead, gritty, but still somewhat melodic voice. The, it was, it wasn't. A, a, it was, yeah. yeah, same thing for a lot of the hardcore bands. There were a lot of hardcore bands and post hardcore bands that did melodic yelling. Yeah, but there wasn't that distinction of full yelling and then melodic singing. Like it seems like this is if this is if this wasn't the first, this was early on in in influencing that kind of vocal which yeah to me is most of the time it's not done very well when people do that i i hate it but <laughs> occasionally there are some um people that can do it here and there but not a lot but that's the one thing i could say that this album is is so insanely influential not just to the sort of alternative metal post hardcore scene but also um uh, a new metal and groove metal, rap metal, all of those things, they all owe uh, their careers to this album. Um, yeah. But I, I just, I really do think, I, I, you know, I was a bit harsh on the, <laughs> the first half of this episode, but when you're talking about an album like this that's just so solid, and sounds so fresh even today. And then you get to more recent stuff that just, there's something missing from it. And worlds apart. When an album yeah. hits you so hard, it is, as much as I would like to be more um, objective or whatever, I, I, I can't. I can't separate an album hitting me really hard and influencing my life when compared to albums that are kind of disappointing. And um, so we find ourselves on this other end of the spectrum where I'm just talking about an album that will be a favorite of mine for the rest of my life. And it is, it is one of those albums. Like somebody will bring up an album um, and say, you know, what about this album? And I'll usually go, yeah, that's a good one. But if you say helmet meantime, I'll be like, fuck man, I'll throw, I'll throw, I'll flip a table over. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, you know, I mean like clear, clear my schedule. No, let's, let's talk about meantime, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I feel, I hate being so harsh on Paige Hamilton, but at the same time, he was the mastermind behind this. So at the same time, I'm giving him so much props for influencing me and and the music that I play. So that's my meantime is my number one, our joint number one. Joint number one. That was awesome seeing the seeing the four four in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and to and to think yesterday they were gonna be switched. I was I strap it on was number two. But the more the more that I thought about it, the more I'm like, yeah, I bet he's got to be number two. So then we end up here where we're just all samesies for half the episode. That that's what a, what a great way to close out the 2020 season. Yeah. of of cranked and ranked season. That's right. We got seasons, baby. <laughs> I Hell don't, yeah! I don't even know how to do that in the podcast. I did. They're all just episodes. They all started off way we're back cool. with the old head podcast. We'll just call the year seasons from now on. That's fine with me. <laughs> I yeah. like that. So it, yeah, so that that wraps it up for uh, for not only for for helmet but for 2020. Um, do you have any parting thoughts before we wrap it up for either either about helmet or about uh, our our uh, I don't know I don't know our 
our future of, of Crankton ranked, I guess. Uh, well, um, we were going to do something along the lines of like, uh, uh, 2020 like releases kind of thing mm -hmm. but really i i haven't really paid attention to a lot of modern music this year apart from apart from two releases uh so should we or or were you gonna do like a, a video by yourself I'm, I'm doing a top 10 video yeah so you but you I'll, can I'll, you can talk about yours on here yeah i'll, I'll probably just say if you're not listening to you know, that Mr. Bungle album that we talked about <laughs> for like yeah. a month straight. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're wasting your life. Get on that shit. But uh, what was the name of that Reaper album? It's called Stranger uh, Than Fiction. That's the one. Stranger Than Fiction by the band Reaper. Awesome. Awesome album. Go Brit check it out. British metal band from Liverpool. And they have a... It's, they're they're a mishmash of classic metal qualities, and they they do it really well. And they're they're super underground. Like I think everything it's self released. There's no label. Yeah, they're a band that needs more people to talk about them, and I will, <laughs> just not today. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that is. Uh, those are the two releases. I'm going to try and pay more attention in 2021 uh, because I'm sure that with all of this. Uh, downtime from touring bands have had plenty of time to get together and write oh shit so. the, the, the number of albums that may be coming out in 2021 it's 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 makes your head spin <laughs> thinking yeah. about it all throughout 2021 i think i'm gonna make more of a point of when i hear something cool i'm gonna shoot it your way so you know yeah. maybe you can get onto the Please some of do. that shit too yeah because i really appreciated that uh stranger than fiction reaper like oh it's so fucking good yeah like i i haven't heard something uh new that sounded so classic in a long time yeah and it doesn't and it's not forced sounding it sounds very natural no it, yeah it doesn't sound like they're they're purposefully going for anything they're it just it just comes to them it's just yeah. natural it yeah. feels good sounds good hit it up Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go look up Reaper, Stranger Than Fiction, and do yourself a favor. Um, but yeah, I'll be doing a top 10 albums of 2020 video. And um, yeah, so this, is, this has been a fun ride on, for, for 2020. Um, um, it's, I, I guess it's made, I guess a lot of people have been doing these kind of things. You know, everyone's finding a way to cope in 2020. I mean, you had like, you know, Charlie Benante doing all those collaboration cover song things like it seems like everybody's really we're, we're all very lucky that technology works the way that it does during oh. this pandemic because jesus christ yeah because i almost feel like some of us are going to be coming out of this year better for it like you know it's weird to think that way that some people's yeah. lives have been ruined i understand that and i understand the magnitude of what's been going on but some of us you know, we've made connections and we've, yeah. um, and I, so I think that that's the best thing in the world to me to be able to take something bad and make something good out of it. And so that's what I'm hoping 2020 brings is like, not only, you know, will we will continue this podcast, but also bands, like you said, I hope that they've used this as a time to yeah. really, you know, put out something phenomenal. Um, I, I re I really do hope, I hope I said this in a video that isn't that it hasn't come out yet, but I really do hope that 2021 is a year where I have money problems because there's so many good albums coming out. <laughs> yeah. I I would say try and put a positive spin on things and uh every cloud has a silver lining, you know? Yep. That's true. That's a, I think that's a carpenter's lyric or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so yeah, so that's that's been uh, cranked and ranked for 2020. Thank you for listening, and we will be back uh, first week of of the new year, I think, probably. Yeah, let's have let's have a look at the. Uh, I'm going to load up the calendar real quick. Uh, we're, we're taking the weekend off for the holidays for for the Christmas time holidays, and then we're we'll reconvene. Um, I think we're going to reconvene with a video episode. 
Cool. So for those of you who um, aren't already subscribed to the Old Head YouTube channel, go do that because we're going to occasionally be doing shorter form versions of Cranked and Ranked where we, um, it's totally on video. I've been putting out some short snippets of the podcast video wise, but I'm not ever going to do an entire episode that way because there's just not enough going on and it takes a long time to kind of throw that together. But, um, yeah. but we will be doing another video on, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it should be fun. But so, um, so we'll be, we'll be coming back next year to, to, um, rape your ear holes again. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, we're awesome. gonna knock your socks on your asses. As I think that was a tenacious D thing. They, they may have both. <laughs> that may have that may have been two tenacious D references in a row. I don't know. What is it where the, where the, the, the announcer comes in? The Paul F. Tompkins. It's like they've they're, they're here to come in your ear, pussies. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> well, on that note, um, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for those of you who've been here since episode number one. Uh, thanks for helping us make 2020 a, a pretty um, relatively good year. And um, if you're listening yeah. to this on YouTube, you know, put your comments down below, and and also um, you, uh, recommend some bands because you know we have ideas of where we're going to go. But I think occasionally a, a name will be dropped where I go, oh, like like today, Eddie mentioned Living Color, and I'm like, oh, why haven't we? been planning on doing living <laughs> color we should be doing that yeah. um, so we we still have a lot of so bands many good to go. bands <laughs> a, lot, a lot of good bands a lot of good years that we're gonna yeah. get to um so yeah that's all for for me for 2020 um thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll see you next year eddie take us out I just, uh, what's what's a good what's a good page hamilton like kind of kind of thing what's what's a good uh, uh, like, uh, later, when on a rider. <laughs> later, when on a rider. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>